Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 112 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Gilpaka. Thanks for joining me. 112, how long is this going to go on? That's that's the question that's running through my mind right now. But anyway, I really appreciate you guys coming by and watching the podcast. The numbers are doing really good. Uh, they're doing good on YouTube, on uh, Spotify, and on Facebook, combined with, um, with uh, all of the podcast apps um, and Rumble and stuff. I mean... We're reaching probably 20,000, anywhere from 12 to 20,000. It varies in there. Um, individual views on these different platforms, every podcast. So thanks. If you're the, the people that are telling people to watch and they're sharing it, I just want to say thanks so much um, for what you're doing. It, it's really helping and it's helping spread awareness of what's going on in our community too, because it's a weird time to be a gun owner. Anyway, um, we've got a lot to talk about today, so I'm going to get right into it. But first, I want to uh, thank our sponsors, Vortex the force of optics. Thanks to our friends over at Vortex Canada for continuing to support our podcast. You can check out all their great products at vortexcanada.net. That's vortexcanada.net. And our great friends over at the Saskatchewan Rivers chapter of Safari Club International. Uh, They do a lot of great work over there, including supporting the CCFR radio podcast and gun owners. So if you want to check out their other great work, you can find them at sasriversci.com. That's sasriversci.com. All right. Now, I'm losing my voice because I'm having to do the television show uh, every week. I want to talk to you about that. And uh, and then, of course, I got to do the podcast every second week. And so this week I've had to do both. I did episode four of the television show, uh, CCFR Radio on the air. And for me to do television, like I'm not, I'm not especially good at this kind of stuff. Um, and so for me to do like television, even to a point where it's passable, which on TV, I'm sort of passable. It's not, it's not very good, but it takes me like literally 20, 30, 40 takes to do like a four minute thing because I'll stutter or I'll think for a second or whatever. You know, you can get away with that on a podcast or, or talking too long about something, but you can't get away with it on TV when there's a timer running here, right? A, a broadcast timer. So it's like exhausting. But anyway, so um, so yeah, uh, the television show is going quite well. Um I think uh, there's nothing like it on TV. And I, I don't know if anybody, if any of you guys have seen the TV show, let me know what you think in the, uh, in the comments and I'll read them. And, uh, and I just like, kind of like to know what it looks like from the outside to you guys. But I think it's, I think it's doing well. And I think it's important that we have a show like that where casual gun owners and hunters and stuff find out what's going on in the community and find out what's coming at them because they can't see it yet. Because if you're not part of the kind of political aspect of our community, you won't see it coming. So anyway, it's a lot of work and I'm hoping it's going to be worth it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, the interview that I did for the television show in a second, but there's a couple other things I want to talk about real quick first. So um, the CCFR, as you know, filed an um, an injunction application to extend the the amnesty for the the gun ban. And I'm not going to go through all the details or details or whatever, uh, other than to say that it's kind of interesting that we're standing here five weeks away from the amnesty running out and the government has said a word about extending it. And if you think about it, and this is the, the point that I want to make, if you think about it, the purpose of the amnesty was they said, we're going to roll out a gun ban or God forbid a confiscation program. And to protect you because you're good people, you haven't done anything wrong to protect you from prosecution you're going to have this amnesty and we're going to put it way out two years. So we'll have rolled out whatever it is we're going to roll out before that happens. You're okay. And here we are. They haven't, they're, they're nowhere. That gun, that, that, that gun buyback program is nowhere. They're still doing focus groups um, on, with gun owners to, to establish whether or not, you know, different ideas of how to get this gun ban done is working. They are not at a point where they can roll something out have all the guns back in and for it to be reasonably at a point where you shouldn't possess these firearms anymore to May 1st coming up in five weeks. So they know they're not, that that's going to expire and people are going to be in legal jeopardy. You know, good people, right? Not criminals, good people. And they haven't said a word. And, you know, I, I think the, you know, 
the frustration is for me is like, well, what are you trying to do? Are you going to wait till the last minute? What do you want to make people sweat? You want to give them a reason to be, to be, fr- you know, frustrated and, and have anxiety. You want to make them anxious because they don't have enough to be stressed about right now. I don't know. It's just kind of, it just the behavior of this p- specific government is just, it's just atrocious. It's, it's, it's just horrible. It's filthy behavior. Yeah. Anyway, I just, I just like, cause the thing is I have to deal with this stuff and then I'm starting to think about it. Right. I'm like, wow, you know, would you ever do that to somebody? Even somebody you didn't like, would you want them to, to feel like they're going to go to jail? You know, when they haven't done anything to deserve it. I don't know. Anyway, we filed that application, um, for an injunction and that for two reasons, basically one is if the government lets that thing expire, we want to be protected. So we're hoping the, the federal court will do it or two, when they see this thing coming down the down the line at them, the, the federal government see this injunction application and the court is considering it, maybe they'll be nudged to make an announcement and extend that amnesty on their own through, you know, on their own volition, right? So, and to do that, obviously it's it's really expensive if you want to do it right. If you're a one-man show law firm, you can throw a piece of paper at the court and if they if they rule in your favor, fine. If not, whatever, right? You haven't lost much. But the thing is, um, an injunction application is like a mini court case. You have to have affidavits. You have to have evidence. You have to have a legal argument. You got to argue it in a hearing, all that stuff for you to be successful. So if you want, if you want it to be successful, you have to, you have to actually put some resources behind it. You have to put some effort into it and to do that's expensive. So the reason I bring that up is I just want to thank everybody that has continued to support us. So everybody that's continued to buy a membership and to, and to donate to us and, and probably for most people more than, more than once, because it's a small group of people, it seems, um, relative to how many gun owners there are, a small group of people that keep the CCFR going. And I just want to tell you how much I really appreciate that. And we couldn't do any of this stuff without you, right? It's not to do with us. It's, it's about you. So thanks for that. Anyway. Um, I'm hoping we're going to hear something soon about the amnesty or get a ruling from the court because all that stuff was filed like two weeks ago. So just want to give you an update on that. Okay. Um, back to the TV show. Well, no, before I, I talk about that, see something like that on the TV show would cause me to have to do it all over again because <laughs> I don't get away on TV with the stuff that I can get away with you guys here on the, uh, on the podcast. Um, but anyway, I did want to mention something and you've heard me mention this before, but the reason I have to tell you this again is because it's important to me. I never want to feel like people think I'm ignoring them and I get a ton of messages. You, you know, I hate to be, I hate to repeat myself too. So I'm in this box in this corner now, but I, I just get so many messages and they pile up and people send them to me on Facebook through messenger. They tag me and stuff on Facebook. They send it to me on Twitter. They tag me on Twitter. They send me emails. And, and it's like probably half of those messages are probably important things that I should see, but I physically can't do it. And even, even if I see it, I physically can't see it, process it and respond to it because the stuff that we're doing in the CCFR is so much work. If we're going to continue to put out projects and to try everything we can, like it's a lot of work to do that for a very small group of people. And it's just, that's why I don't respond. I don't want people to think I'm ignoring them because you know, I'm, you know, sitting with my feet up somewhere and I could care less. That's, that's, that's completely the opposite of the truth. I just physically can't work any harder (laughs) and, and do these things because the projects that we do have to get done and they have to get done right. Like I'm even going through the, the national, um, the national uh, range day website. And I'm like, this needs to change. And this needs to change, even though we released it two weeks ago, it needs, it still needs to be better than it is. So we're working on that. So, I mean, we just don't, we just don't throw something out and like, that's our project, take it or leave it and whatever. So we work really hard and, and it just leaves no time for me to deal with these messages. So if I haven't gotten back to you or even looked at your message, you can, you know, cause you can see in a lot of these platforms, whether it's even been looked at, you know, like it's, I'm not trying to ignore you. I just physically can't, I just can't do anymore. Okay. And I don't have anybody, I don't have a personal assistant. Uh, I have actually, actually tried to hire one one time, but it didn't work out, but I don't even have an assistant to go. Yeah. Look at this one or don't look at that one. Right. So just forgive me for that. We're doing the best that we can. And maybe, maybe someday I'll be able to, 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 uh, to go through all these messages. I probably have a thousand, uh, friend requests on Facebook, <laughs> like a thousand of them. And I don't want to just go approve, approve, approve. Cause who knows who's in there. I don't even, I don't even know who my friends are. I got like 4,600 of them. And so, yeah, I just, so don't, don't be mad at me if I haven't approved your friend request either. Right. I just, I just can't do it anyway. 
it's important to me to, to important to me to, to tell you that. So, cause I really appreciate your support and stuff, but I just, you know, I am, it is what it is. Okay. So getting back to the CCFR or, or CCFR radio on the air, which is our television show on wild TV, we're up to episode four. I just finished recording it before I recorded this. That's why I'm kind of so frazzled and punchy. Um, and I just want to mention something cause it was, it's really worth mentioning. So I had Martin Van Rutenberg from MDT, uh, on, and one of the things we talked about was, um, one of the problems that one of the symptoms of the, of a, of a big problem that we have. The symptom is um, discrimination, irrational and malevolent discrimination against gun owners and against firearm related businesses. And as you know, um, firearm related businesses get their bank accounts closed and they have, you know, they have other businesses refusing to, um, to do business with them. The CCFR, I've experienced a lot of that with the CCFR. Um, and even Martin had um, a large bank close his bank account closes and just send them a letter after doing, after taking God knows how many service fees from them, how much in service fees, how much in interest and financing and stuff, just close his account, send them a letter and says, you got two weeks to find other, other banking arrangements because we're closing your account because your business does not align with our corporate values. And if you think about that for a second, I'm going to try not to get too sidetracked, but if you think about that for a second, a, a, a federally regulated, well, not, not MDT because they don't make regulated parts. They don't even make guns, right? They make stocks and bipods and stuff like that for hunting rifles and sporting rifles, right? Like long, long distance shoot, long distance shooting, right? Not even action shooting for God's sakes. But anyway, banks, like a pedophile, a convicted, multiple convicted prolific offender pedophile can get a bank account and a bank wouldn't close their account, Right terrorists can get bank accounts or even former terrorists can get bank accounts. No problem. Rapists, you know, child abusers, all can have bank accounts. No problem. But a firearms business or a firearm instructor for the RCMP King and firearms program somehow shouldn't have a bank account. Like just it's, it's upside down world, complete lunacy. Like it's madness, right? It's, it's completely insane. Um, you know, I'll probably post that interview with Martin at some point, but even had PayPal close his account after they had taken fees, right? Pay, PayPal takes fees and they, they add up to a lot of money. And not only did they close their account, but they kept the money that was in MDT's account. They kept it like the CCFR used to use PayPal exclusively. Sometimes there's a hundred grand in there. Like if we had a fundraiser or whatever, it's, it's fast. Like the money comes fast and then we take it out. But depending on when they decide to stop your account, they could be holding on to a lot of money, right? And they kept the money and they said, oh, too bad. You're so horrible. We won't do business with you and we'll keep your money. You can come to the U.S. and sue us if you want. We'll just, we'll throw a bunch of, I mean, PayPal is one of the biggest corporations in the world, right? Like it's a big, big company and they, they could care less, but that's how they treat you just as a gun owner or a firearm related business. So that's a symptom of a problem. And this is the interesting part. Sorry for being so long. So this is the symptom. What is the problem? The problem is, is you have the federal government that, that their opinion is, is that nobody should have guns, but them. Okay. And then you have the, the mainstream legacy media and they're propping up the government. So they help spread that, 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 uh, that narrative they're, they've woven a narrative and they help spread it. Now, the two of those things together are the most powerful force in the country bar none, nobody's even close, right? Super powerful. And then the government's narrative that they push down on individual Canadians are guns equal violence. The reason why you have firearm related violence is because people can legally own guns. And the way to stop it is to, is to confiscate guns from law abiding gun owners. And by the way, if you have any law abiding gun owners that disagree with this, they've got to be racists and white supremacists and misogynists and whatever other ist that you can come up with, right? That's the narrative that's been woven and the mainstream media propel it. And who are these people that are receiving this narrative? They're everyday Canadians, overwhelmingly the vast majority who have never even seen a real gun. So they have their government and their media legitimizing that government narrative and it's getting pushed down upon them. And they're only hearing one side of the story, just one side. How could they ever hear our side of the story? We're, we're nothing right? Or nobody's look at how powerful that is, right? Is it, is it true? No, it's completely false. And the minute you get into it and start looking at things for yourself, you're like, this is completely untrue. It doesn't matter, right? It's being propelled by the, by the most powerful forces in the country. 
And these people, the majority, only hear one side of the story. What can we do as individuals? How do we, how do we overcome that? It's, it's a huge task. That's why we're fighting the same fights today and spending all this money doing it that we fought 20 years ago. That's why that's happening. This is a hard thing to do. So the offset to that, our effort to stop, well, I mean, obviously we've done tons of stuff in TV and explainer videos and tours and marches and all the rest of that stuff, right? That we've done. But the, the antidote to that, as best we can, as best we can do is National Range Day. Why? Why is it so important? It's because think about the first time that you ever shot a gun, right? Because I can remember, and this is why I have the kind of the perspective that I have, because it was when I was 35, 34, I think. It was the first time I never owned a gun. I was like, why do people even have guns? Aren't they dangerous? I think they are. And I probably would have agreed. So you know what? If nobody has a gun, how can there be firearm related violence? Because I wouldn't have known any better. And I'm not stupid. I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I'm not stupid. And most Canadians aren't stupid, truly stupid <laughs> either, right? So what happened to me? How come I'm sitting here in front of you right now? Because somebody took me shooting down in the United States when, when I was there for business, working with the military. And one guy's like, hey, you know, you want to shoot a gun? I'm like, I want to shoot a handgun. And that's what changed. We went to the range, sweating. I was under stress, shot, you know, 60 rounds. I'm like, as soon as I calmed down, I was like, this is awesome. How come I can't have a gun? I can, I see how these things work. If you point them in the right direction or if they're unloaded, they'll never hurt you. Like I started to understand. And the more I understood, the more I got into conversations and the more I understood the issues, the social issues better. And that's what created what you're watching right now. So how do you get more people to understand that? You welcome them into our community. You show them who we really are, which is welcoming great people, safest Canadians, most highly vetted Canadians in the country. And you let them shoot a gun. How do you do that? You make National Range Day a success. So how do we do that, right? These are all building blocks. You stack one on top of the other. And here's how you do it. If, if you're an individual and you're a member of a gun club, you go to your gun club and you say, we need to hold an open house on National Range Day. And you, you, there's very limit, limited time left. There's only two months and three weeks left before National Range Day. You have to get that scheduled now. Go to your gun club. Are you doing a, an event? No. Why not? Why are you doing an event? Because if we don't all do it, it's going to fail. It's just going to fizzle out in two or three years until you remember that national range. Yeah, I never really went anywhere. You know, oh yeah, the new gun ban coming down. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going to have a march. We're going to do a TV show. We will spend all the same money fighting the same fights that we've been fighting for 30 years, right? If So we have to make it a success. So to do that, are you guys, are we going to, as a club, hold an event? Yes. Perfect. I'll volunteer. I'm going to find some other volunteers too. Or no, why not? Why aren't you doing that? You know, if, 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 if we have all of our guns banned, it's our own fault because we didn't take the initiative when we had the chance. Okay. Firearm organization. If you're not a member of the CCFR, you're a member of another one. Are we going to recognize national range day? No. Why not? Why aren't we doing that? We all got to pull together. Like it's, it's now or never. They have added over 600 guns to that ban list in two years. They banned the whole bunch of them and kept adding, adding, adding over 600. It's not never going to stop unless we do something and we got to bring people in. We got to make it politically unappealing for the liberals to do this. We got to have more people understand why people own guns and that that's okay. And that's a benefit that's important to people. Make it important to them, right? That's how I got into it. And if your, your wildlife federation isn't recognizing National Range Day, if they're not sending out emails to all their members to do what I'm telling you in, in their own clubs and get more people in, ask them why they're not doing that. You know, there's nothing, there's no conflict here. Nothing says CCFR on any of this stuff. There's no excuse. There literally is no excuse. So this is what we have to do. It has to be a success. And if you're an individual and you're not a member of a gun club, Make sure that you do your social media posts. Tell people why guns are so important to you and do it in such a way that it's welcoming to people and take somebody shooting. Take it upon yourself to take one person or more, if you can, out to the forest with your guns, teach them how to shoot a gun and make sure they have a good time. Smaller guns are better, like 22s, lighter caliber, right? 17 HMR, maybe something bigger like your SKS or whatever, but take somebody shooting and just chat in a, in a non-confrontational, easy, laid back way about why you own guns and why it's so important that you do that. Okay. 
National Range Day isn't for the CCFR to make it a success. We're working on everything to make it as perfect as possible, but it, you all have to do it or it will fail. Okay. And you got to do it soon because these things take time to plan. Events take time to plan. So that's the symptom to the big problem. The, the antidote, the barely working antidote, right? That we can do, but what we can do is national range day and made, make it a success. So important. I can't tell you. All right. That's all I want to say. Okay. I've talked for 20 minutes. Um, Sorry it was so long, but let's get Wilson on right now. All right, on the Skype, we have Tracy Wilson. Wilson! <laughs> Giltaka! How's it going? Ooh, busy. Yeah, How are no you? kidding. Uh, busy also. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, we got a lot to cover, so we might as well get started. First thing is the CPC leadership candidates. We announced them last time. Mm -hmm. I think we got an extra one, uh, an, yes. <laughs> a new addition, which is Patrick Brown. But uh, you've got some other info, so hit us with it. Yeah, so we got five official candidates so far in the 2022 CPC leadership race. So I'm just going to run through them real quick because some people are not familiar with all of them. We've got Pierre Polyev. He's a local Ottawa, longtime member of parliament, Alberta raised, 42 years old, married, couple of young kids. We've got Leslyn Lewis, who you may remember from the last leadership race. Uh, she's a brand new, fresh conservative MP. She's a lawyer, a doctor, a pro-life social conservative. She's a lady and a lady of color. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, we've got Patrick Brown. So he was a Barry City councillor in the early 2000s. Uh, from 2006 to 2015, he was a federal member of parliament. In 2015, he stepped down as an MP after being elected leader of the provincial PC party with hopes of becoming the premier of Ontario. Uh, those were dashed pretty quickly with a massive sexual assault scandal, and he was actually kicked out of the party. Doug Ford went on to lead the party to victory. Uh, his um, PC leadership was also marred with a bunch of weird scandals. There was some stuff about voter fraud and election rigging. He was investigated by Hamilton police, and it it was it was a little bit um, shady, not to, to say the least. But he went on to be elected the mayor of Brampton in 2018, 10 months after being ousted as the leader of the PC. And now he would like to be the prime minister of Canada. So that's where we stand on that. Um, then we've got Jean Charest. So this is uh, the resurrection of a politician, is, is what I call it. He was elected originally as a Quebec member of parliament in 1984. He served in a number of Mulroney era cabinet appointments until 1993 when he became leader of the old uh, federal PC party. Uh, he then entered provincial politics and was elected leader of the Quebec Liberal Party and went on to form government in 2003 and served as the Liberal Premier of Quebec until 2012. Um, he was really involved in a lot of the long gun registry data fight. He was furious with Harper. He wanted to take it to court to maintain that data. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Um, huge supporter of Paul Lissouvien in the Coalition for Gun Control. And he was instrumental in Law 9, which of course is this really arbitrary extra law that Quebec handgun owners or restricted gun owners um, have to endure. It requires an annual competency test. Um, it's tied to their RPAL, so you can't avoid getting it. Um, so, you know, you have to think about what a charade, uh, charade government would look like for Canadian gun owners, because now he would like to be your prime minister. And then we've got Roman Baber. So Roman is a rookie Ontario provincial uh, MPP. He was elected in 2018. He was ousted by Ford last year in 2021 for his opposition to lockdowns and a bunch of uh, COVID mandate measures. He's got a law degree. He immigrated from Russia as a teenager with his family. And that's really all I have dug up on him so far. So those are your choices for now. We'll see if anybody else enters the race. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll update that as we go. All right. So the field grows, but yes. uh, but we'll see. I'm sure one or two will drop out uh, as it gets a little further down. It's um, it's it's tough. It's it's great that when everybody steps forward to get involved in the race, because and anyone should be able to take a shot at becoming leader, although it just it does burn up a ton of money. 
um, from yeah, conservative. Yeah, it's really expensive yeah. to enter these leadership it races. Is. It is. And you have to have the ability to sell an enormous amount of memberships. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. I mean, uh, we'll see what happens. But you're right. Usually uh, a number of these people will sort of drop out as the race progresses. Um, it closes, I believe, in June, and then it will will get a new leader in September. So it's it's quite a long race. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, now this is really important: is h- how the ranked ballot works. So you know we've we've been through um, a few leadership elections, and uh, and we've seen twice in a row um, the second place winner, as far as the person that got the most votes, the second place becoming the party leader. So mm-hmm. not everybody understands how the ranked ballot works or how to, like, if you believe. And I'm going to give you kind of the long setup here. But if you believe that the person who's the most popular, that that more people want to be the leader of the party, that gets the most votes, should be the leader of the party, then you have to understand uh, how you're voting and you have to vote accordingly. So give us a quick rundown on that. Yeah. So we'll use right now for an example. So right now we've got five official candidates. So if they were to, you know, issue out ranked ballots to the members of the party to vote right now, it would more than likely have spaces one through five and they want you to rank your favorite. So, you know, whoever you really, really like the best, you would put them in in first place and consecutively down to fifth place. Well, the problem is, is that you may remember back, um, I think it was the 2017 leadership race, you had Maxine Bernier way out in front of Scheer and and O'Toole and, and the other guys who were running. And of course, I was at that leadership convention and every round, Max was always consistently ahead until we got to the third last round. So all we had left was O'Toole, Andrew Scheer and Max Bernier. Everybody else had been knocked out and there was a lot of contestants. So what happened was, is when what somebody gets knocked off off that round, their votes go to the next person that those supporters most voted for. So what happened was the O'Toole supporters also had Andrew Shear on their ranked ballot. So all that support, or at least, you know, a, enough of it went towards Andrew Shear. It sort of catapulted him past Max Bernier, which in the end, your second place guy one first place. Another good example is in the very last leadership race that Aaron O'Toole won. During the race, um, there was less contestants, but I remember he caught a bunch of flack because he was putting out these promotional videos. And one of them, he said, look, you know, if you're not entirely sure, put me as your second choice. And people were ridiculing him and uh, ridiculing him and laughing because he was saying that. But that's how ranked ballot works is you get that, that whoever they put first if that person gets kicked out, then it's you, right? So you have to be very careful with a ranked ballot. Like me personally, I am a card-carrying conservative member, so I can only speak for myself. But I only put names that I am willing to see be the actual leader. So just because there's five spots or however many spots we end up with, you're not obligated to fill them all. That's very important because you may be unintentionally putting you know, second, third or fourth tier support behind somebody that you really don't want to be leader. So that's important. The other way that you can maximize your influence on the leadership race is, we went through this last time as well, is teenagers 14 years old and up in your household, and well, in any household, can also be card carrying CPC members. Now they may not get to vote in a general election, but they do get to vote on leadership within the party. So for an example, Colin's got three teenagers, I had two, so between us that's five. So we increased from two votes to seven votes, right, Are in our house alone. So, you know, that's an option for you. Uh, membership's $15, you can get them online. Or if you really wanted to throw extra support behind your candidate of choice, if you go to their website and get your membership through them, it helps support them because they have to sell a certain amount of memberships to actually qualified to run, right? So so that's really important. The deadline, again, to get your membership to even have a say in leadership, regardless of who you like, is June 3rd at 11.59 p.m. Um, and it's, it's important if you care about leader. I got people, you know, sending me messages and emails and tags on social media and sending me information about all these candidates and who they like and who they don't like. At the end of the day, none of that matters if you don't give yourself an opportunity to have a say. So 
Um, that's pretty much all the political funding I personally do is keeping up my membership. But that's because I want to have that say in who becomes uh, leader of the party. So those are some really important things to remember. So but going back to how to use that ballot, which is really important, if you just mm -hmm. if you want a certain candidate to win, only put their name. So yes. there'll be one, two, three, four, five. People think they got to fill them all out. No, just put your favorite candidate as number one. Don't put any others because if that candidate doesn't win or they come in third or whatever, that vote that you just made will go to the next person on your list and then they, yeah. they will win. So if there's people that you don't want to win under any circumstances, don't put them on the ballot at all. And and I don't I don't feel like we're manipulating the system there. It's really more like you have it's to understand. Choice. Yeah, you have to understand how that ranked ballot works. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't, the very first time I voted in one of those, uh, one of those leadership elections, um, I, I filled all, it was the two, two leadership election cycles ago. So I put all 13 names in there in order of what I thought that I, you know, that I thought they should be in. And it's like, well, I didn't have to do that at all. I could have just put one name in there. So yeah, anyway. I, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what I'm going to do this time is just put in that first name in the first spot and that's it. That's I, yeah, yeah that's by what putting I'm do them too. in any position, you are giving them support. So if you want to make sure that not only do you not, you know, you don't give any support to a candidate that you absolutely don't want to see, don't put their name anywhere on the ballot. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. that's only, you know, if you feel like that, then that's how you do yeah. it. All right. Next thing. Um, not a lot to talk about here, but the commissioner of firearms report came out and I think it came out, I don't know, a month or two ago and you've had a chance to have a look at it. What, uh, anything interesting there? Yeah. So here we are in 2022 reviewing the 2020, uh, commissioner of firearms report, but all kinds of things have been delayed the last couple of years. As you know, there's a couple cool, uh, tidbits in there. There are currently 2,206,755 firearm license holders in Canada. So that's that's a big number. So that's great. We got to keep growing it and maybe more than that now, because as I said, this is the 2020 report. Um, but yeah, those numbers are are good. They're growing. They're sustainable. And we have to keep increasing them. Well, what's kind of interesting with that is of all the propagandizing and all the, the villainizing and all this stuff and people are still getting PALs and they're still renewing yeah. their PALs and they're still buying more guns. And so, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, if there's anything encouraging, that's it. No, no gun owners going, I looked at the data and, you know, I heard what Bill Blair had to say, you know what, I'm going to give up my guns. Cause it's, it's obviously oh, that's the, not happening. Yeah, the wrong thing to do. So anyway, well, that's, that's good as, as, and if you think of it in terms of older people may sell their guns or pass them down and not shoot anymore, let their license expire or people die or, you know, whatever, there's still a replacement there. We're still we're still moving forward. So yep, that's yeah. good. That's good. Mm -hmm. You know, despite everything, right? Is the whole point there. Hey, these are unfriendly times, and I I, I get the frustration, oh, yeah. and it, it, you know, I guess the easy thing would just to be forget it. I'm getting out of this, and and whatever. But that's not what people are doing. That number keeps increasing every year, and uh, we, we'd like to see it grow even more. For sure. All right. Uh, next thing is um, quick at the end. Uh, we will will. We'll end on a positive note. The Toronto Sportsman Show, you're heading there, um, what, day after tomorrow or something? Yeah, I'm heading Wednesday to help set up. The show opens on Thursday. It runs from March 17th to the 20th at the International Centre in Toronto. Um, of course, they've removed the COVID uh, vax mandates, which is great. So it's open to everybody. I will be presenting on the great outdoor stage on Saturday at 3 p.m. I'm going to give a little spiel about National Range Day and try and keep everybody uh, focused on the prize here, which, of course, is growing our community. And we'll be in booth 1040. Come by and get your membership. You can come and renew. I'm going to have all kinds of swag, T-shirts, hats, all kinds of stuff for sale. You can enter a bunch of raffles we're going to have there or just come by and say hi, show us some support. And it's just super exciting to me to actually see other human beings instead of on uh, on Zoom squares. Right. So looking forward to it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, right. I won't be there. I've uh, I've taken on too much with the television yeah. show and everything. I just every single week um, I can't really go anywhere or do anything at least at least until this season's over. And uh, God forbid I have to do another season of it. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, I have a feeling who will. So well, I don't yeah. know. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, okay. Well, I think that's it for now. I really appreciate uh, the update and we'll see you in, in a couple of weeks. All right. We'll see you then. Thanks. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of the CCFR radio podcast. Thanks, Tracy, for all your hard work. And thank you for sharing the podcast and telling people to listen to it. There's a lot of good information that happens in these podcasts, including like the insight that comes with the conversation that we're having. And it's really important that gun owners hear it. Okay. And last time I'm going to say it, at least for this episode, because I'm going to talk about national range day for at least another two months till it's over is this is your chance. If you're online, barking about, man, I wish there was something I could do, or yeah, I, you know, I, I, you know, I want to volunteer. I want to step up. Like this is your chance. Okay. So go to your gun club, ask them what they're doing. If they're not doing something, ask them why, if you need help, go to nationalrangeday.ca and send us an email. Okay. If you need help, get some other gun owners together, go, how can we, how can we get things happening at our club or our wildlife federation or our gun work, right? There's no reason why any, by why every single organization at any level is not participating in this. None of the stuff says CCFR, my face, Tracy's face, nothing is in the, in the commercials, nothing is anywhere. It's for everybody. And we did it that way for a reason. It's not about the CCFR. It's about a last ditch effort to save your guns. And this is the only way that we're gonna, we're gonna show people who gun owners really are because the legacy media and the government is lying to everybody nonstop. You really can't blame them for knowing only one side of the story because we haven't been able to tell our side. This is it. This is your chance. So please, if you're going to put any effort into saving your guns, now's the time. Okay. Thanks so much for watching. Take care, everyone. And we'll see you next time. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.